So welcome everyone in the name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I hope and pray that uh, we are all uh, well and we had a good uh, day so far, wherever you are, in whichever part of the world. I want to encourage everyone that um, we can uh, spend time with the Lord as we uh, look at uh, what the Lord wants us to do in this time and age where we live. I hope and pray that um, we will be encouraged by what God is showing us in this such a time as this. Uh, we are locked down and everybody's at home and uh, limited services, few people working. But uh, let us see, there's hope. And that's yes. why we're here. There's hope. And then we can uh, understand what God wants us to uh, look at. So uh, we'll pray before uh, we look at God's word and what he has for us in store today. Okay, so let us pray. Let's bow our heads and our hearts and humble our hearts. Mighty God, merciful, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed privilege you've given us where we could study your words and understand. I want to thank you for being with us this far and uh, uh, providing us with all our needs, wants, and our desires and opening our hearts and our minds. I pray that your spirit will be with us, cleanse us, every single one of us, especially me as I stand up to uh, for you. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would close all my thoughts. You would only say what you would uh, say through me. I pray that um, you would uh, forgive me and cleanse me, make me whole, that you would take Satan and out of uh, this place and his angels, that your Holy Spirit and holy angels will hover over in everyone who is watching and listening, that your grace may transcend to each one of us. This I pray, O oh Lord, in the worthy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, so if everybody mute, mute your mics and um, we're going to look at a PowerPoint so that uh, we can um, understand uh, and see what God wants us to uh, look at in this time and day and age as we live today. I believe we are living in the... Uh, last generation before Jesus coming. And therefore, it's profound to understand how these things are going to pan out. So um, here at uh, prophecylife.org, uh, by the grace of God, launched last week, learn from the past, the present and the future. So as we go along, we're going to look at um, what's uh, uh, it has in store. So again, last week I uh, presented this in reach and outreach resource. Uh, this uh, booklet as a PDF is on prophecylive.org. So if anybody wants to download it, share it with anybody re for your own resources to share with everybody, it's for one and all, for every person on planet Earth today. It can go far and wide. If you want the literal printed version, you'll have to get in touch with us. But you have the electronic version on prophecylive.org. And if you continue on, then you're saying this whole series we're going to look at, starting from last week and continuing on, is all based on the great controversy between God and Satan. And it's primarily over worship that we need to understand. And who will you choose to worship? That's the key. And as we go along, that's what we're going to look at. And not to forget, everything is in the, through the sanctuary. God told to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell again and gave the full description. So everything is through the context of the sanctuary. And Psalm 77, 13 again always says, thy way, Lord, is in the sanctuary. How great a God is our God. Okay. So we'll be looking at a lot of prophecy today and in the days to come. And even what we looked at last week, last week we had just an overview and in fact, the overview of that presentation also is on the, the presentation presented last week also is on prophecylive.org in the form of PDF. So anybody wants it, you can uh, take it and use it to share it, talk to people, whatever be the case. And also the chart that was presented and explained is also there in the form of PDF on uh, prophecylive.org with all the detailed explanation from the Bible uh, to tell what the events are and how they will occur as prophesied by the grace of God given to us today. So learn, we need to learn how to understand Bible prophecy. And um, there's nothing I'm telling you. We're going to see what the Bible says, how to understand Bible prophecy. 
So here, if you see in Ecclesiastes, past, present, future. That's what our basis is. So you have past, present, and future. And if you read Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 15, that which had been is now. So that which has been is past, now is present, and that which is to be is future. But it says it hath already been. Okay, and God required that which is in the past. And if you see again, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9, it says the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. There's no new thing under the sun. So what we're seeing now, what we're going to see in the future has already happened. And that is the thing that keeps the Bible alive. And we need to understand Bible is a live book and amazing. Okay. Uh, last week we touched about the signs of Jesus coming and I recommended everybody read Matthew uh, 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. And so that you'll understand the signs of the time. So a quick summary here. We're not going to read any of those. We're not going to touch these because our topic is different. Um, so false cries, wars, famines, deaths, uh, martyrs, global upheaval, pestilences, all of these are listed uh, according to what we have, what we always see. But um, if you see Matthew 24, there at the end you have um, Matthew, uh, global upheaval, Matthew 24, 10 to 13. So the very next verse, verse 14 in Matthew 24 says, and this gospel shall be preached in all the world as a witness and then shall the end come. And this is what we're trying to do now. And the verse after that is the topic for today. And that is the abomination of desolation. And if you look at the abomination of desolation, you will notice that um, it is profound. And we need to understand what happened in the past so that you can see what happened in the, what is happening now and what's going to happen later. And this is the topic that uh, is being talked about. 24, verse 15 says, yeah, when you see the abomination of desolation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So let us understand what is abomination. What is abomination for us? If you look in the dictionary, it says a thing that causes disgust or loathing. And what is desolation? Again, the dictionary says a state of complete emptiness or destruction. Okay, keep that in mind because that's what we're going to look at today in the presentation. So in the signs in Luke 21, 20 to 21, you would notice that uh, we have this um, um, prophecy that Jesus told will be one of the things that you need to look at before he comes. So here it says, and when he shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now this is occurred in the other uh, gospels as well. So Matthew 24, 15, when he therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So let them which be in Judea flee into the mountain. That's verse 16 of Matthew 24. So what is this? We need to understand. So Jesus is telling these are the signs that will happen. So you need to read what the prophet Daniel said about the abomination of desolation. So we need to go there to understand what that is. So if you continue on, you would notice we need to go back to the past. That's the basis of all understanding that we learned from Ecclesiastes. So here, one, this is one example. This is not the first desolation, so to say. I'm, I picked up a couple of examples to understand the abomination of desolations in the past. So here, this is one example. And so the Greek ruler, Antiochus Epinemius, was the king of the north who fulfilled this. This is according to Daniel chapter 11, by the way. And he outlawed all forms of Jewish worship and all other practices, including circumcision, and were forbidden on pain of death. This is what was done. Sacrifices were to be offered instead of various pagan days. Then in one city, an altar to the Greek god of Zeus was set up at God's temple in Jerusalem. Swine, biblically unclean animals, were offered on this new altar, further desecrating the holy place. 
this happened. And then you would notice that um, this is exactly what they did. They brought a swine and put it on the altar and they did this in 167 BC, right on the temple, desecrating the temple, abomination of desolation. Another example, abomination of desolation, again, you see here, and uh, this is based on Ezekiel chapter eight. In Ezekiel chapter eight, you see, uh, if you read from verse uh, five to 16, you'll see amazing things, really shocking things, I have to say. One of the first thing you see, idolatry symbol of jealousy was set up at the entrance, yeah, at the door. And then another thing you see, as uh, Ezekiel was sent in to see in the vision, then you see 70 elders offering incense to false gods. Okay, 70 elders there. And then you go on to see, and then another thing they did, you see the woman weeping over God Tammuz. You know, so Tammuz is the sun god. And then the next thing you see, he's shown that between the altar and the porch, 25 men facing their backs to the temple are facing the sun towards the east and worship the sun. Ezekiel 8, if you read uh, 5 to 16, abomination of desolation in the past, why Jerusalem was destroyed. Time, time and again, it happened. So very, very next chapter, talking about Ezekiel chapter 9, 1 to 6, if you read the whole um, verse, verses, you will notice that God said to six people to take up their slaughter weapons. And one person who was clothed with uh, linen to take an ink horn, he had ink horn on his side, to go and put a seal on those who, mark actually, on those who sigh and cry. Put a mark on their foreheads, those who sigh and cry, of the abominations that are happening in the beast. And then he says to the six people to go and slay utterly, old and young, both maids, children, women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Remember, it's all sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient of men, which were before the house. Who are the ancient of men? This means the leaders, the elders of today. Another example, just to quote about uh, the various abominations that took place through the generations of Egypt. So, but the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They walk not in my statutes and they despise my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbath, they greatly polluted. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. Ezekiel 20:13. So more abomination continued. What about today? What's happening today? What is happening today? Look at this. This is uh, I don't know. This happened on 23rd February 2013. The first vote on new legislation in the 19th Kesnet. Kesnet is a parliament in Israel. Was initiated as a joint effort between Yesh Atid's. Rabbi Dov Lipman and Jewish Homes, Naftali Bennett. And surprisingly, the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, easily passing the vote, the Kessner decided that Sundays would now be an official day off from work. Until this time, the children of Israel were following six days shall they labor and do all their work. Seven days the Sabbath of the Lord their God. So six days work, seventh day, Saturday, Sabbath rest. But now, two days a week, falling in line with the rest of the world. So if you go back now to see what Daniel 24, 15 and Luke 21, 20 to 21 is talking about, Daniel 9, 24, that's where you begin. And then we go through to the end of 27. So starting at Daniel 9, 24, we need to understand the full context, of what the issue was. What brought abomination of desolation? So here, Daniel 9.24 reads, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. What are these things? There are seven things. First one, to finish the transgression. Second one, and to make an end of things. Third one, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. And fourth one, and to bring in the everlasting seal of the vision. Sixth one, 
and the prophecy, seventh one, and to anoint the most holy. This is the chart. If you look at the chart here, 70 weeks are determined upon the people, children of Israel, and the city of Jerusalem. And we will look at this a little bit in detail. We need to understand this uh, Messiah that has come and was rejected. So if you continue here, in Daniel 9, 25, Now therefore, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Yeah, that's just a picture that somebody drew of Nehemiah building the wall. So this will be in troublous times. If, if, you, if you read the account, when they were building, there was trouble. People were trying to come and prevent them from building. We're not talking about that for now. We just want to identify what happened. So we'll go on with understanding what is written. So the next verse, you see, and therefore, and after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, now this people of the prince, this prince, we're going to identify, this prince we're talking about is not identifying Jesus. This prince is talking about the prince of this earth. The people of the prince that shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Because prince represents two in the word of God. You have Jesus and you have Satan. Jesus is not going to come destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's not what he's trying to tell you. He's telling the prince of this world is going to come. We're going to see that. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. It's going to be with a flood. And on to the end of the war of desolations are determined. Today, if you go to Jerusalem, old city, this is what you see. Ruins of Jerusalem today. Uh, people go there just for sightseeing, Bible land tour. This is what you see. Okay. So now this brings us to the prophecy of the Messiah. We read 70 weeks are determined. 70 weeks are determined. So if you look at uh, the book of Daniel, there are three basic time prophecies. So you have the 2300 day time prophecy. We're not going to look at that in detail because we're looking uh, about the abomination of desolation. So the abomination and desolation context is the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. So now the 70 weeks begins here at 457 BC. Yeah. And it ends at 34 AD. And the events are there all in the uh, chart that you can see. The day to rebuild found in Ezra 7 and then AD... Uh, 37, you see the baptism of Jesus. Sorry, AD 27, you see the baptism of Jesus. AD 31, that's when Jesus was crucified, ascended, and Pentecost. Everything happened in AD 31. And in AD 34, Stephen of Stoats, which brings the end of the 70 weeks. But look at this, because 70 weeks are determined for the Jews. And if you did not accept the Messiah, then you will not be a nation anymore. There's more context to look at it as we go along. And if you see there, that's when the gospel goes to the Gentiles. The book of Acts, if you look at the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 to 7, apostles are appealing to their fellow Jewish countrymen. Acts 8 onwards, now the gospel is gone outward towards the Gentile world. Because as a nation, the uh, children of Israel rejected the Messiah as prophesied. Let's look at this a little bit. So in the next picture, you would see here, uh, these are the first, these are the decrees that were going out to rebuild Jerusalem. The first decree, according to Ezra chapter 1, you would see Cyrus gave this first decree, second decree was given by Darius, in, according to Ezra chapter 6, and then according to Ezra chapter 7, that's what the third decree. And that's when um, the rebuilding of Jerusalem actually took place. Of course, uh, in 537, you would see. Um, Zerubbabel went and then uh, Ezra went and then following after this 457, you see Nehemiah going too. So seven weeks, the wall was built. Jerusalem streets were built and everything else. So they finished in 408. If you look at history, you will see that. And then Daniel 9.26 comes here. Three score and two weeks are determined. Now that they will uh, reconcile and understand who the Messiah is and is going to come and all of that. Because um, when Jesus came on the scene, um, Nobody thought that he is the Messiah. Born among the Jewish nation, the children of Israel. 
And then in AD 27, you see he was baptized. AD 31, he was the, co the covenant of the weak is confirmed as you find in Daniel 9.27. And 26, coming to pass here. And we won't read the list at the bottom because we already read that in Daniel 9.26. So if you continue on, this prophecy of the Messiah was given to them. For unto us a child is born. For unto us, look at the seven points here again. Interesting, amazingly described what will be done. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So this person who is going to be born, who the whole world and the Bible tells Jesus was born but this jesus is also called the everlasting father he's called the counselor he's called the mighty god so people were not identifying this jesus to be that god jesus of nazareth let us see in fact isaiah 53 tells what all he will do when he comes and he did in the sight of people but they did not accept him what an unfortunate scenario what is the situation for us today in this 21st century? How many people accept this Jesus Christ? We'll learn about it a little more. Okay, let's continue here. When Jesus came, you can see here, hereafter I will not, Jesus told when he was on this earth, when he was preparing for the final events of his life on earth, here he says, hereafter I will not talk much with you, for prince of this world cometh. We already saw the prince of the world in the book of Daniel. Okay, the prince of the world and had nothing in me. John 30. So if you see here, identifying the prince of the world are so and look at them. Ephesians 2 2, ruler of the kingdom of, of the air. Ephesians 6 16 is the evil one. Second Corinthians 4 4, the God of this age. Uh, John 12. 31 and 16 1 it says the prince of this world revelation 12 3 an enormous red dragon revelation 12 9 that ancient serpent called the devil or satan so we know who the prince of this world is so if you continue on you would see in revelation 12 3 and 4 this prince now coming to play revelation chapter 12 is the whole essence of the great controversy between god and satan so and there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to de devour her child as soon as it was born. So now look at this. There's, there's a woman here and there's a, about to deliver and the dragon wants to deliver. The dragon is the prince of this world, which is Satan, the devil. And now if you look at um, who the woman is, let's identify who the woman is. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman, Jeremiah 6, 2. And it also goes on to say, and I put, I have put my words in thy mouth and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand and that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, thou art my people, Isaiah 51, 16. And I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Revelation 21, 12. So now from just this few passages, there are other passages too, you can identify the woman or God's people, meaning even the city. So now if you continue reading Matthew 2, 1, this is the first advent of Jesus on earth. So now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, and behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Why are we looking at this? Look at something very important. We're looking at the armies of the prince of this world. And then you see, and when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. 
Matthew 2 and verse 13. So now, if you see, continue reading in verse 16 of Matthew 2. You see, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wrath and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coast thereof from two years old under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So now Herod is angry and sent to destroy all the children two years younger. But God in his mercy kept the child so that the prophecy has to be fulfilled. God is so amazing. While we are studying these things, imagine our life and our scenarios. Don't forget that. While, while we study prophecy, whatever we study, we should apply things in our life real time. So what is it for us? So God will protect his people. We'll understand that as we towards the finishing this presentation. So here again in Matthew 11 and 5, the child waxed and grew up and Jesus was baptized. We saw the prophecy and then three and a half years he ministered. What did he do? Just an example here. The blind received their sight, the lame walked, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. These are all the things that Jesus did, some of the things that Jesus did as we uh, can understand. And you can read all the gospels and you can see all that he has done. Now let's go back again and just touch a little bit. Daniel 9.24. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. Seven things here. To finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and to seal up the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay. Let us see here what happens next. So when Jesus was on this earth, Remember this incident recorded in Matthew 21, 12 to 13. Jesus went into the temple and he had to chase people out. Let's read it. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. So abomination of desolation even abomination was happening there and therefore desolation is going to come what is happening today in our scenarios in our lives individual lives in our homes as families in our churches and congregations is there abomination what are we doing we need to examine because desolation will come and continue here matthew 27 verse 51 and when christ died on the cross, this is Jesus' crucifixion. He cried, it is finished. John 19 verse 30. And gave up his life on the cross. The priests were officiating in the temple at that particular point. Because they did not believe this Jesus. So they had nothing to do with him. In fact, they are the ones who crucified him. So they are busy going about their activities and their business. And uh, it was the hour of the evening sacrifice. They did it everything precisely on time. And they were doing what they would do on a normal routine weekly basis. And that's what we are doing today as well in our lives. In written life, we're doing things as normal, thinking uh, all things are going to be okay. No, I'm here to tell you it's not going to be okay. Things are going to change. And we are going to look at a few things. So here it says, when they were officiating in the temple, it was the hour of the evening sacrifice. And as the Passover lamb representing Christ was about to be slain, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. So the sacrificial system finished. So no more sacrifice, but still people sacrifice in the world today. In quite a few religions, you would see that too. This is the basis, the sacrificial system that God set up as a remission of sins was a symbolic for the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus came and paid 2,000 years ago. Since then, there should not be any sacrifice, but unfortunately, people do sacrifice even now out of ignorance. And it is important that people understand to tell those who know should tell those who don't know. Let's continue to read Matthew 23, 37 to 38. It says, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem. Now, Jesus is telling while he was teaching and preaching when he was on this earth. Thou that killest the prophets, and stores them which are sent unto thee. 
how often would I have gathered thy children together? Even as a hen gathereth her children under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left desolate unto you. Okay. Now Jesus said, you have killed the prophets that were sent to you. You can read the whole Old Testament record. You can see that. And thou hast stoned us them which sent you unto you. Now, in AD 34, they stoned Stephen, who was proclaiming that he saw Jesus on the right hand of the throne of God. And who has ascended to heaven. What amazing testimony he was giving. And people who saw Jesus, they knew he went to heaven. They tried to suppress it. They tried to hide it. They tried to suppress the testimonies by giving money and telling them to fall, tell falsely. But they did not recognize and identify. Therefore, as a nation, they were rejected. And it says here, to finish the verse, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus prophesied it, he said it, he proclaimed it, and so it happened. So now, just to review again the 70 weeks prophecy, which is 490 years, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, the nation, chosen nation of the children of Israel. Unfortunately, did not accept the one who came to save them and everybody else in the world. So here again, just to review, 457, it happened, 408, they finished rebuilding the temple. AD 27, Jesus is anointed in, but through the baptism and the Holy Spirit now comes and God speaks, all three present there. And then you see the week that goes by uh, completely here. So uh, Jesus crucified, uh, then he died, buried, resurrected and ascended, AD 31. And then AD 34, they stone Stephen. The gospel goes to the Gentiles. What is the situation? And that is why everybody else who's not a Jew by genealogy have this privilege. And that is why we are Jews. We are children, of, uh, descendants of Abraham, children of Israel today, spiritual children of Israel. Okay, let's kind of go back here and quickly look uh, again about the prophecy. Luke 21. Uh, 20 and 21a and when jesus when and when he shall see jerusalem compassed with armies then know that desolation their office nigh. then let them which are in judea flee to the mountains now let's look at this what happened after jesus ascended so we're looking at the time period now after the cross after ad 34 after jesus said your house will be desolate unto you talking about god's temple now let's look at um, this one in ad 66 the jews rebelled against rome rome was still the emperor controlling all the nations of that time there and uh, including uh, the children of israel uh, so here the roman general cestius gallus surrounded jerusalem with the 12th legion they pushed to the temple gates before retreating and uh, the Jews destroyed this retreating 12th legion while they were retreating. They thought they were successful and well done, a job well done. But the Christians that were there, probably some of them are old enough to hear uh, um, Jesus speak. And maybe they heard from their parents that were there alive and Jesus was there. And the apostles preached about it and talked about it. And then Acts chapter 2 talks about this uh, destruction of Jerusalem coming through. And uh, they all fled. The Christians that were in Jerusalem fled. Because three and a half years later, somebody else comes. Titus comes. And there was no escape. Because you need to understand how they do this. They surround the whole city. The army surrounds the whole city. Nobody can go in. Nobody can come out. We're going to learn this. So here you see Titus destroys, arrows shot at those escaping, Syrians forces met with the disarmed escapes looking for gold coins, woman ate her own child, Mary daughter of Eliezer from Belzeb roasted and ate her infant son. One million Jews were crucified and 97,000 were captive. Now we need to understand what happens when a siege is done on a city. So the siege of the city began on 14th April, 70 AD. Three days before the beginning of the Passover that year. 
So this, so all people from across the land came into Jerusalem for the Passover. So majority were there inside Jerusalem. So the siege lasted for about four months. Usually, if you, if you continue reading, usually you will see that a walled city normally stores things up for four months. So they have supplies to survive without going out and to get things to survive for four months. So here you see, it ended in August 8070 and with the burning and destruction of the temple. So this is uh, an account just to keep in mind why things happened and how they happened. Okay, COVID-19, we're all locked down. I have to touch this a little bit because it is key. We need to understand lockdown and social distancing and what it means. So we're going to have a slight simple health snippet here in this um, presentation. So the health snippet is, on April 16th, Dominic Rahab told the UK that the measures would continue until May, the lockdown measures we're talking about, and top officials saying it could be up to six months before we're allowed out again. This has been said. In fact, if you read various news that's coming out, they're saying it can take up to two years, 18 months, 2021, 20, and even longer. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, look at this. What I recommend everybody, God's principles are eight laws of health, nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. These are key. If you have these key, key principles, you know what you'll have? Good immunity. That is the key. Because what are they saying? What is COVID-19 is affecting? People who are weak immunity or immunocompromised or suppressed or whatever be the case are the ones who are affected and susceptible and are more possibly dying. So now look at this. Even the doctors out in the world are telling us this. This I got from www.webmed.com. So here there are six immune system busters and boosters. And what they list is you are short on sleep. Okay, now they're, they're highlighting the principles that are described in the word of God of, on health. You are short on sleep. You don't exercise. Your diet is off. You're always stressed. These are the terms they put on their website. You can go and check. You're always stressed. And the most important one, you're too isolated. Number six, not to forget, you have lost your sense of humor, meaning talking and communicating and having laughter is the best medicine, as they say in this, uh, in this day and age. Number six, I want to touch that. You're too isolated. You know, immunity goes down when you're isolated. Immunity builds up when you're exposed to all kinds of things. That is how, how, how immunology works. So when you're locked down, more people's immunity is going to go down and more people will become susceptible to the virus. Can you see what is happening? Serious uh, implications. That is why we have to understand the gospel in its true presentation. God wants us to be in good health so that we can be good representatives of him and show people of all the things. So I want to recommend to you, try and see how you can implement God's laws of health, eight laws of health. You can do this eight laws of health. If you do those things, you're locked down. You're in your house. Don't worry. Try and follow all of these principles. Oh, sunshine comes through your doors and windows. Or if you have a back garden, you can go on there. If you have a balcony, you can go on there. Keeping the, uh, Don't break the law of the land. I'm not here to promote to break the law of the land. I'm here to promote God's principles. Exercise. Exercise in your home. You can exercise in your home. Let's continue. Okay. So the abomination of desolation in the past. This is what happened. In AD 70, they came and destroyed. Let's look at another uh, statement here. Why Jesus told in Matthew 24, 15, abomination as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which stands in the holy place. Stands in the holy place. So now we need to understand exactly what that means and what God is revealing through the word of God. So now we feel it's Zechariah 8, 3. And thus said the Lord, 
I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts and the holy mountain. So Jerusalem, by the way, you should know, is built on seven hills. So seven mountains, so to say. So the mountain itself where Jerusalem is, is holy. That is the key. So when you see this, you will understand. So now if you go back to Daniel 9 and verse 26, after three score and two weeks shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, but the people of the prince that shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, because the sanctuary was inside of the city, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and on to the end of the war, desolations are determined, meaning a flood is going to come. Flood, we is here again explained what flood is in psalms 18 4 you see the sorrows of death can pass me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid so flood also represents ungodly men so ungodly men came and surrounded and pitched on the mountain around jerusalem so that is what is being spoken of here so now this is just a picture to show you what happened uh, in the time ad 70 now let's look at something very important. What is unholy? Okay, this is just a Roman legion. This is how they would dress and go when they go to battle. So when they surrounded Jerusalem, they would have been having something of this sort. So now if you notice in front of the army, you have people who are bearing standards. Now these standards are dedicated to their gods. So now they would go in the front and march. They would pitch the standards on the ground wherever they're going to fight or conquer, whatever be the case. And they would pitch that there. And then everybody else will bow down and pay obsonance to it before the command is given to attack. So look at these standards and we looked at them in a little bit in detail. So here the Roman unit standards played an important role both ceremonially and on the battlefield okay remember they have ceremonially and battlefield so it's used for both so the standards themselves varied greatly from the legions of eagle and imperial portrait image of various cohort signa like flags and even dragon wind socks they were sacred symbols and holy to the men to them if the state got lost they would get very upset and thought they would have bad luck in the battle so that's why the standard was always there and by the way when when the battle begins the ones holding the standards would go to the back of the army and be there they cannot leave they have to be there so they're there behind the army so if anybody turns back they see the standards they know that god is with them and they continue to fight that's how it works so this is a roman soldier kit that's what they would have so the standard is the one that has the flag and has its emblem so now if you look today even if you go to any roman empire's building that exists today and you would see inscriptions like this and this simply means spqr is abbreviated on the standard and this abbreviation can be found on any statutes and you would see the military standards it stands for senatus populosque romanus meaning the senate and the people of rome so this is the roman empire's standard and in the days gone by this is what everybody used to have but let us look this is the past we're now going to go into the time after the roman empire let's have a look so this even exists now okay after the roman empire taken over after the Roman Empire fall, when did the Roman Empire fall? The Western Roman Empire fell in AD 476. And today, the Papal Rome comes up. We we'll look at that slightly how it comes up and what of that. So now let's look at the Vatican flag. This is the Vatican flag. Today, you can look at the flag and see what's on there. On this flag, look at that um, complex um, thing that's put there. It talks about if you start from the top and goes down on the right side, you see it's the galactic phase and the galactic equator. So there's the galactic equator means we're talking of the galaxy. We're talking of the universe. So the, they have reached above the earth. That's what it means. And if you uh, if you go on to the there's a crown there and it's a triple crown. Can you see the triple crown? It says the third heaven, meaning 
the, their king over the heaven and the host of heaven and the earth and the lower regions of the earth, meaning Satan and the angels. That that's what is being symbolized here. And then if you continue, you will see um, on the left, you see the key to the silver gate, three portals through the gates, and then representing the crossing through the dimensions out of the other side. And then on the left side is the key to the golden gate. And they have three levels of the gate. Interesting. We'll not discuss too much there. Just want to show you what is being presented or represented here. Now, this is a little bit slightly different. This is called Pope of Rome, Coat of Arms. Pope of Rome, Coat of Arms. And this is what the symbol is. So here, I'm not going to describe this. It will be available for you all to go and read uh, at a later time, whenever you want. But I want to touch one point. Right in the middle of the shape that looks like a shield, it says it has a cross and it has IHS. IHS. What is IHS? IHS simply means Jesus, Savior of men. And this is the Pope of Rome, coat of arms. Can you see what is happening here? Abomination, abomination, abomination. Now let's look at, that is the representing the first beast of Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10. Now let's look at the second beast of Revelation 13, 11 to 13 and 14, even to say. So now here, if you look at this, this is a $1 bill. And uh, Thompson's intent was to find a phrase that contained exactly 13 letters to fit in the theme of the seal. That was the effect when they're trying to formulate this. So on the observe, you see 13 letters, 13 stars, 13 horizontal stripes, 13 vertical stripes, 13 arrows, 13 olive leaves, and has 13 layers. All of these, 13 is used in occultism, if you study and understand. Just to, just to let you know. Well, look at another thing here. In the middle of the dollar, you see this, and it says, annuit coeptis. That's a Latin term. Well, uh, America is predominantly English. I don't know why Latin terms are there. Anyway, that's another thing. But see the meaning. If you look in a dictionary, you'll see the meaning of this annuit coeptis. It says, he, meaning God, has favored our undertakings. That's the dictionary meaning. And what's the Novus Ordo Seculorum? Again, the dictionary says, a new world or order of the ages is born. I picked this up from most of my things I picked up from dictionary.com, an online dictionary. So here, if you see, what is it saying? God has favored our undertakings and a new world of the ages is born. Let's move on. Can you see this? On the other side of the dollar, there is another eagle. And can you see the symbols? And even on the right side, I put this National Security Agency. Can you see the symbol? Eagle holding a key at the bottom. Can you see what is being said? Papacy, America. Revelation 13 coming to pass, right from some ages past. Let's continue. We're not going to read these verses because we already read them. Luke 21, 20 and uh, Daniel 9, 26 and 27. We're not going to read this. But I want to get to the essence. The essence of it is who is the abomination of desolation? First one is Israel. Who caused Israel? Second, Rome. Remember this. So in the abomination of desolation that were caused, there are two manifestations, two manifestations, spiritual and literal. Jews rejected the Messiah, the Holy One, and the literal and his Roman armies came and desecrated the holy place. This history is going to repeat itself. We already saw the makings of it in this presentation. This is going to repeat itself, and that is the key. So if you continue on, Daniel 11 verse 44, I want to say, I believe and understand that we are living in this time period as recorded in Daniel 11 verse 44. And it reads like this, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Who is this him? This is king of the north, which is papacy in that time period, according to Daniel chapter 11. If you read the preceding words, that what you will identify that it is the papacy. So therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly to make 
away many. So two things which are tidings out of the east and out of the north is going to trouble papacy. That's what it says. And he will go forth with great fury to destroy many. That is the essence of the verse. Now let's look at this. We need to understand how this is shaping up in the word of God. So Isaiah 14, 13 to 14, will first touch the north. Okay. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Okay. So Lucifer then was to, uh, said, I want to sit where? Upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So God and heaven is in the north of the earth in context. So now he wants to sit in the north. So now the second coming of Jesus Christ is from the north and you would see because god is sitting in the north this tidings is going to trouble papacy and another one if you read the revelation 7 2 to 3 and i saw another angel ascending from the east now this is the tidings from the east having the seal of the living god and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees Till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So the seal of the living God is the tidings of the East, which is going to trouble papacy. What is this tidings? Seal of God is the Sabbath. That's another topic. We will, we will study that in Bible prophecy life um, over another time. Whenever the Lord permits us to do that, we'll understand what the seal of God is. And it is, as I say now, the Sabbath from the word of God. We will study that another time. So the tidings from the east is the seal of God's Sabbath. Tidings from the north is the second coming of Jesus Christ. This, in effect, is the last message of love that I like to say is found in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. So the three angels' message, as people like to call them, the three angels' message is the last letter of love from God to this generation every nation kinder tongue and people not to a denomination not to believers not to just people who know jesus it's for everybody whatever they are wherever they are every nation kinder tongue and people so this is going to come to pass and see how it's going to affect so once these tidings are presented like what we are doing right now and countless people doing around the globe speaking about this keeping the commandments of god especially the fourth because the fourth is going to be a test of who you worship in the time to come. We're going to look at that a little bit. And then proclaiming the second coming of Jesus Christ, which will ultimately end in that in this generation. So this is going to trouble the papacy, is going to kill many. What does this mean? So if you see the last verse of Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12, which is part of the third message that is described there as a third angel if you like to say it so here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of god and the faith of jesus revelation 14 12. so what, what what do we need to have the saints need to keep the commandments of god and have the faith of jesus remember this a lot of people have faith in jesus but what we need to have is faith of jesus that is the key to understand because if you don't have the faith of Jesus, you may not make it when Jesus comes because we need to understand the gospel in its full context. I just put one verse at the bottom, which we will read, but there are a lot of verses you can read of what the faith of Jesus is, not faith in Jesus. A lot of people have faith in Jesus, but you need to have the faith of Jesus. So you need two things to be able to go with Jesus when he comes. Keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So faith of Jesus, because in Galatians 2.16, you're saying justified by the faith of Jesus Christ, not by faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, Galatians 2.16, you can read the full verse if you like. That is the spiritual implication. There are always two things I wanted to say. There is spiritual and literal 
throughout history in the past and even now for us so for us the spiritual is we have to have the faith of jesus and the literal is you have to keep the commandments of god because revelation 22 verse 14 says blessed are they that do the commandments of god do the commandments of god not keep Lord, the, uh, the children of Israel were keeping the commandments of God to the letter. We need to do the commandment. That's why Jesus said when he was teaching them, he said, your righteousness should exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. So just doing to the letter is not right because we are not doing it in the spirit of what God wants us to do, which is the faith of Jesus. And uh, by the way, the, just to touch the commandments, it's all about God's love. First four is love, God the next six love others these are the two commandments jesus told when he was on this earth which is the greatest commandment love the lord the god with all the heart with all the mind with all the soul this is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like on it love the neighbor as thyself and further on next time he again he said love the neighbor as i have loved you so that is what is needed it's all about love and having the faith of jesus let's read this galatians 2 20 it says i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, it's personal. Unless you take this personal and sacrifice, meaning I am crucified with Christ. We have to do what Jesus did. Give up everything. He gave up heaven. And his right to the throne and ruling the universe and everything that goes with it. Just for me, I take it personal. I don't know about you. Because the writing here is, I am crucified with Christ. So unless we live that life that Christ wants to live in us, we cannot, we cannot overcome the flesh. And by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is powerful. We, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us the power to overcome the things of life that we hold so dear. We like this and we like that and whatever. I don't want to mention anything, but some people like some things, are different people like other things. If your love of those things is more than the love of Jesus, we'll be in trouble. Okay, what's going to happen? Sooner or later, this is going to come to pass. It's all about worship. Like I said in the beginning, it's all about worship. If you read from the beginning, you would see it's all about worship. It's about who you worship, when you worship. It's key. Because fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments describes whom to worship, when to worship. Yeah? And that is the key. And therefore, we can understand why to worship. So if you don't know why you're worshipping, when you're worshipping, how to worship, whom to worship, we're in trouble. That is why we need to take it from God's word. God's word is nothing but Jesus Christ revealing himself and telling who he is and what he wants us to be and what he wants us to do. So we follow God's word, not traditions or not man. So then if you continue here, if you look here, it says, don't worship on Sunday. If you don't worship, I forgot to put if, if you don't worship on Sunday, you will be killed. It's going to come. Revelation 13, 15 to 17, you will be killed. Just let's read the verses at the bottom. Luke 18, 8 says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? So if you don't have the faith of Jesus, now, before probation closes, I don't know what's going to happen. So we have to have this faith of Jesus. Because when Jesus comes, only that faith is going to keep. And then Revelation 22, 14, I already said, Blessed are they that do his commandment, that they may have right to the city. This is going to be an acid test for every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Every person on humanity. So let's look at a few more things. The abomination of desolation is here. And it will only end with Jesus coming. So let, let, let's uh, look at a few things here again. This is Daniel chapter 7, the little horn coming up after Rome fell. I said it, Rome fell in uh, 476 uh, AD. I mean, the Western Roman Empire fell in 476 AD. Popes came into prominence. And then an important event took place. 
an important event took place here in 508. It is profound to understand this. In 508, an important event took place. This is when the Roman Catholic religion became the religion of Europe. So this is the date the religious acknowledgement of Catholicism took place outside of Catholicism and moved even further. So this milestone is known as the setting up of the abomination of desolation in among some circles. You can read about this in Daniel 8, 13, Daniel 11, 31, Daniel 11, Daniel 12, 11. All these texts are talking about these things. So what happened? Let us examine. In AD 508, Clovis received the titles, this is Pope Clovis, received the titles and the dignity of Roman Patriarchus and Council from the Greek Emperor Antastasius. So what are these? We'll find out what that is. So the meaning of Patriarchus, if you look in the dictionary, it says a person of noble or high rank or aristocrat, such as an aristocrat. So that title was given. And then if you see another thing that happened, Chloe's received a towards the insignia of the councilship from the Eastern Emperor Antasisius. So the emperor not only gave him the title, he gave an insignia. And what is an insignia? It's a badge or distinguishing mark of office or honor. So now an office is given to papacy in Rome in 508. And this is how it continues. So now this is the establishment of the abomination of desolation, if you want to say that. And then if you continue, it goes on to say, the counterfeit priesthood was established in 508 throughout Europe. These are the things that happened since 508. And the Pope and the priest forgive sins, change the communion service to transubstantiation, remove the second commandment, shorten the fourth commandment, whom to worship, when to worship. And then another thing, another out of the countless things, just listed a few things here, by the way. Child baptism through sprinkling, controls entrance into heaven via purgatory and selling of indulgences, and set up Sunday worship and many other traditions, countless traditions. Let's continue to see a little more things that happen. So the little horn among the 10 horns in 476 AD when Western Roman Empire fell, now emerges and becomes a big horn and speaks like a dragon. So it happened since 508 and becoming a religious political power in 538, one of the seven heads, it was an empire from 538 to 1798, receives a deadly wound in 1798 when Pope was taken prisoner, sent by um, Napoleon from France, sent General Berthier who came and took him and Pope died in uh, captivity. Then the wound the healing begins in 1929, political, Power is restored. We will touch that a little bit, God willing. Resurfaces as a beast, not as a head. Thus we have the mark of the beast and not mark of the head. And all wondered after this beast. In Revelation 13.3 you see. That is today as it is happening. Major world leaders were at the funeral of Pope John Paul II. This is amazing. That is the, one of the fulfillment of the all world, all one, world wonders after the beast. No political leader, world leader, has ever had such representation at a funeral in the past. No political world leader had such representation of all political world leaders attending the funeral of Pope John Paul II. Pope Francis now is man of the year, Nobel Prize nominee, and so many other things. So look at this, the abomination of desolation. This is Bentino Mussolini, which is on the right signing the Lateran Treaty on behalf of King Victor Emmanuel III. And Cardinal Gasparavi left signed on behalf of Pope Pius XI. This is what is happened in 1929. Revelation 13.3, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was sealed. So the wound began healing on February 11, 1929, and it is still about to finish soon now in our day. Just a newspaper ad I put there to say that this is interesting to note that um, the Roman question was a thing of the past and the Vatican at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs and the memorable document, 
the document interestingly is titled healing the wound an extreme cordiality was displayed between both sides what amazing this is the beginning of uh, what is happening in revelation 17 and if you see in revelation 17 so he carried me away in the spirit and into the wilderness and i saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns so if you see here revelation 17 4 reads like this revelation 17 4 reads like this and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication now today if you look around the bishops of rome are dressed in purple and the cardinals of rome are dressed in scarlet they are showing who they are and who they belong to and what they are doing today jesus that's why he said let him that hath eyes let him see and let him that hath ears let him hear i don't know what the world is doing today revelation 17 comes into being with this lateral treaty in 1929 and verse 5 says and upon her head was a name written mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and the abominations of this earth so i'm not making things up by saying abomination of this earth is papacy the bible says it spirit of prophecy says it a lot of people said it in history even till today so what is the process of abomination let's look at this process just to understand real time for us today these are things happening today in the world and that is why it is important to understand what the abomination is today so that we don't become desolate so analyze the doctrines transubstantiation celibacy call priest and pope father the pope is another god on earth sprinkling for baptism mariology pray to saints priest to forgive sins, Sunday as a day of worship. Sunday is the only one thing the entire world has accepted from the papacy and that is unbiblical today. There are a few who are faithful. There are a few who are faithful. We'll learn about them shortly. Revelation 13.3, papacy is a head. Revelation 13.17, woman is on a beast. And this indicates that papacy, although back in power, she will not control nations as she did during 538 and 1798 AD, she has been demoted from an empire head to the status of a beast nation. Papacy will need an army to make war with the remnant of her seed. Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 13, 7 says, and it was given on to him. This Revelation 13, 1 to 10 is referring to papacy. And it was given on to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, meaning death is coming. Now we come to another time period where you see the first, uh, second beast coming. This is the picture of the description that you find in Revelation 13. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Revelation 13, 11 to 14. I want to quote from the Spirit of Prophecy written by Ellen G. White. Taken from Testimonies for Church, Volume 6, 18.2. And it says, As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Can you see what has been said? Another quote from Maranatha 178.4. The law for the observance of the first day of the week is the production of an apostate Christendom. Sunday is a child of the papacy, exalted by the Christian world above the sacred day of God's rest. In no case are God's people to pay it homage. These are statements. We're entering into the future, which is. Um, about him uh, break upon us as an overwhelming surprise wake up we're actually entering america now if you look at this on september 11 1990 it was said by the then president which is george bush senior he says out of these troubled times our fifth objective a new 
world order. We're looking at the future, like I said, world order, global order, order of the ages, international order, new world order. These are all different terminologies of the same thing. Same thing. And it's going to come to pass. So what is this new world order? What does it mean? Total control of the world's population. That is what it is. How will it come? Look at the stages. These are amazing. Look at this. Abolish, uh, so abolish, abolition of all ordered governments, abolition of private property, abolition of all inheritance, abolition of patriotism, <laughs> abolition of all religion, abolition of the family, creation of a world government. How do we know this? These seven points were the foundation of the French Revolution. This is what happened in the French Revolution, and this is what is taking shape even as we speak. Another thing I want to say, transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world, and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. God's people should be preparing for what is to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Marnas, page 161. One world religion. What is this? As being said, you can read about this in newspapers and in history, in the recent history, not uh, ancient history, in the recent past few years. God has revealed himself in many different ways to different cultures and that therefore all religions worship the same God, but just use different names. This has come from the papacy, by the way. Come from the papacy. So what is this ecumenism that's happening now? Everybody is coming together under the papacy. All mega denominations have signed agreements with papacy to come together, to, the wounds are being healed. What is this ecumenism coming together? Theology unity in doctrinal diversity. If you find out the meaning of ecumenism, that's what it means. So what is the meaning of the new world order? One economic order, one political order, one religion order. This is how it's going to come. The process of this new world order is going to come through economy. If you read Daniel chapter 11, verse um, 43, it talks about it. Economy order, political order, one world religion. That is the process and we're going to see this happening in our lifetime and very soon. And if you continue, what is the goal of the new world order? One world leader. You can see that in Revelation 13, 7. One world government. Revelation 7, 3. Sorry, Revelation 13, 2. And uh, Daniel 7, verse 4. One world religion. Revelation 13, 8. One world currency, Revelation 13, 16 to 18. That is the goal. That means it's going to bring great tribulation. Matthew 24, 16 to 22 talks about it. Mark 13, 15 to 20 talks about it. Luke 21, 21 to 24 talks about it. And the summary of that is listed here. This will be the time of the great tribulation. No other time like it before in the past. That's what is being told. Jesus gives the sign himself and he himself tells what will happen. So the preceding these verses, you see all those famines and pestilences, wars and rumors of wars and all those things. And all those things have been happening with great intensity and rapidity in our day, in these last few years. Now what has happened next is this. So here you see, don't try to say possessions. That's the admonition there. Word to the pregnant and the nursing. Pray not in, in the winter or on Sabbath. Shortened for the sake of the elect. Don't believe here is Christ. False Christ and false prophets are going to come. It's amazing. Need to read this passage in Great Controversy page. Uh, uh, everything is not put here. Pages 40, 443 to 445. If you have time, go read all those pages. I just put a little bit of snippets from here and there. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, talking about America, and causeth the earth and them that dwell wherein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound is sealed. This is Revelation 13, 12. 
on that basis look at this description so in order for the united states to form an image of the beast the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends is that amazing it has been foretold the image of to the beast represents that form of apostate protestantism isn't that happening today which will be developed when the protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas you should read all these pages 443 to 445 part of great controversy the book it says on page 48 persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled abomination is coming will there be desolation a lot of things are happening today on this earth and i want you to see what is going to happen let's look at something this is what um, uh, amazing facts uh, pastor doug bachelor said on 18 june 2015 purpose just for sunday keeping in new save the planet encyclical you know what this encyclical is laudatosi if you read the laudatosi i have not read it but if you read the laudatosi they say it all talks about the sunday going through climate change green sabbath and all of these things so one of the things he says here about climate change the time to find global solutions is running out there is therefore a clear definitive and urgent ethical imperative to act that is first beast of revelation 13 second beast of revelation 13 here usa military presence overseas just imagine look at those just look at those dots country the red dots are country with us military base the black dots are country with access and arrangement and the yellow dots are countries with other forms of military cooperation just imagine just want to make an appeal because this is going to come to pass soon we're going to go through a few more slides and finish choose this day christ or the pope seal of god or mark of the beast in this prophecy live uh, seminars we are going to touch both of this on separate topics because there's so much to go through on each of these topic we'll talk separately about the seal of god we'll talk separately about the mark of the beast let's continue sunday changed there saturday is the sabbath and people go to church change to sunday can you see how many people are going um, on the left side and how many people are going on the right side and they're being told this is the wrong way you need to go back but people continue to go look at this this is straight from the inside from their own words prove to me from the bible alone that i am bound to keep sunday holy there is no such law in the bible it is a law of the holy catholic church alone the bible says remember the sabbath day to keep it holy the catholic church says no by my divine power i abolish the sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week and lo the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the holy catholic church now this is said in february 18 1884 by professor thomas edridge of redemptorist college in kansas city another one boasts of the roman church about sunday looks at this if protestants would follow the bible they should worship god on sabbath day by god is saturday in keeping the sunday they are following a law of the catholic church it was said on february 10 1920 but chancellor albert smith for cardinal of baltimore archdiocese let's continue the mark of the papacy's authority sunday is the mark of the papacy's authority and that is why the bible tells mark of the beast in revelation 13 and revelation 14 okay sunday is our mark of authority the roman church is above the bible and this transference of sabbath 
observance is proof of that fact. When was it said? It is found in the Catholic record. September 1, issued on September 1, 1923 in Ontario. The mark of the beast is not a chip. Mark of the beast is not a barcode. The mark of the beast will be enforced as Sunday observance, which is willful rejection of God's seventh day Sabbath and his law. Now, there are a lot of texts here at the bottom. You could read Revelation 13, 12, which we read, Revelation 14, 9, which we read, and Acts 5, 29 says, we ought to obey God rather than man. Let's continue. If you look around today, today in this lockdown scenario, if you look around, this is what you see. I just put one or two pictures. This is Hobby Lobby. It's a shopping mall. Monday to Saturday, notice, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., closed on Sundays. Why are they closed? To allow employees time for family and worship. Can you see that on a shopping mall? Another one, just to show you, just to put another one. Breakfast, peach shakes are back. We know you miss them. Closed on Sunday. Look at another um, quote here. The substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. Remember this, is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, meaning all over the world, God will reveal himself, he will arise in his majesty and shake terribly the earth. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 140. In other words, when the seal of God is refused, meaning Sabbath, we'll talk about that in a different presentation. If the light of the truth has been presented to you, revealing the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and showing there is no foundation in the word of God for Sunday observance, and yet you still cling to the false Sabbath, refusing to keep Sabbath, holy the Sabbath, which God calls my holy day, you receive the mark of the beast. When does this take place? When you obey the decree that commands you to cease from labor on Sunday and worship God. While you know that there is no word in the Bible showing Sunday to be other than a common working day. You consent to receive the mark of the beast and refuse the seal of God. I paused so that you can digest it. Written in Review and Herald, July 13, 1897. Just wanted to show you some pictures just for illustration. Abomination. And now, and desolation is going to come. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious powers must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own needs. Maranatha 169.2. Picture of Kenneth Copeland. Actually, this picture I clicked off uh, a YouTube where he's speaking. He says he has a direct line to deliver messages from God to President Trump. This is Kenneth Copeland. Let's read this. The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. Maranatha 169.3 How to make an image? How do you make an image? As found in Revelation 13. It is Protestantism that is going to make the image in a U.S. state. It would have to be a Sunday law. The image would have to be exactly like the original. That's why it's an image. The same day of the week, the same, like the same day of the week, the same hours from midnight to midnight for religious purposes. That's what they're going to do. 
This all fits into the picture of Revelation 13 and reveals that the last conflict will be over the law of God. It's time for everybody to make a choice whom you want to follow. You want to follow God or the devil? Choosing this day whom he shall serve, it says. So what is it today? We are finishing shortly. No more playing church for those who believe and go to church. 2,000 years ago, Jews were looking for a lion and got a lamb. 2,000 years later, Christians are looking for a lamb and will get a lion. So when the Messiah returns, he is no longer on a throne of mercy, but a throne of justice. I put this in here so that people can know where to go to. The Catholic Church admits Seventh-day Adventists are keeping the true Sabbath of the Lord. Now, this is from the Catholic Universe Bulletin, August 14, 1942. The Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. This is what they claim. The Protestant claiming the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. This is what they are saying. I'm not saying it. This is what they are saying straight from the papacy. Telling who is right and who is wrong. We are closing. Matthew 24, 44. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. God's Amazing Grace, page 242 says, Many are deceiving themselves by thinking that the character will be transformed at the coming of Christ, but there will be no conversion of heart at his appearing. Our defects of character must here be repented of, here, here and now, before probation close. And through the grace of Christ, we must overcome them while probation shall last. This is the place for fitting up for the family above. So we have to do this now before our names are looked upon. The records are open and judgment is passed on our case. We have to prepare ourselves now. Now, now, now. So therefore, I close with the sanctuary get into the ark because it's all going to be about the commandments of god everybody is going to be judged based on the commandments of god and the commandments of god all the things that are in the ark the commandments manna and aaron's rod everything represents jesus christ jesus is the perfect sinless human who obeyed all of god's laws and that is what we need to have when we have the faith of jesus we will have the commandments in our life that we will follow and fulfill which is love of god so What's our hope? Our hope is to accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ so that um, the sin will not be on him. See, on the left, you have a sin in him, but not on him because he accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the one on the right, sin on him and in him because he rejected the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There will be two groups, the Bible very clearly says, who will accept Jesus and who don't. Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? It is a choice that we need to make now. Now as never before because time is running out. Don't know when your probation and my probation is going to come to an end. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Are you ready to meet Jesus? I hope and pray that um, this presentation too will be available on prophecylife.org uh, later on during this week. I hope and pray that you'll be encouraged to study more and share and understand where we are in time and how soon things are going to change. May God be with all of us. And